All right, so thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Jonathan DeRogers. I work at Bluehost. I am a full-time WordPress core contributor. Um, and I'm here to moderate a discussion with Josefa Hayden. Chomposi, did you say yeah. it? Chomposi. OK, so that's how you say that fancy word, that fancy name. <laughs> that fancy name that I have. Um, I prefer this mic. She prefers to hold the mic. And uh, that's great. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what you do day to day? Yes. Well, um, I recently became the executive director of the WordPress project, uh, which is most of my day to day right now. Uh, your project is gigantic. Uh, there are like 200,000 of you uh, and 150 WordCamps a year. I don't go to all of them, although I wish I could. Uh, but before I started doing that, what I did a lot of and what I still do now is kind of help people learn how to communicate better and work together better. And so I think that I'm well suited to the WordPress space because of that. Awesome. All right. So um, the topic of this discussion is fostering collaboration across cultures. Um, has anybody read the blog post? Anybody by chance? A couple people. Okay. So. We'll kind of get into it a little bit, what it's about, and we are here to take your questions as well. Um, so you, you open up by describing how brains are our prediction machines, but they're influenced by a lot of things, um, such as uh, your stereotypes, past experiences, and these things often end up being communication barriers, especially in a global project like WordPress. Um, so talk about that a little bit. Um, specifically about stereotypes or about how, well, it becomes how, our, a how our brains are affected by different things and yeah. how that affects how we communicate yeah. with people. So I have found I've worked with a lot of large teams, and now that I'm working with this global project and the teams that I work with are also all over the the planet, um, I found that that all of the experience that we've had with people that are like you, like everyone I've ever met, like Sheila, I'm like, I have an, an idea of how this conversation's gonna go, regardless of whether I want to have that idea or not. Because your brain is constantly um, inundated with information, you know, and so it has a coping mechanism. It just pulls together all the information it knows about people who look like Birgit, or <laughs> who look like Angela, um, or, or have the same experience that I understand of them, and just like, define what that pattern's most likely going to be like. Um, and, and yeah, I found that those stereotypes, for the most part, are the things that cause us to not meet people where they are, right? <laughs> the, those are the things that make us um, decide that we know who those people are before we even hear about their actual experiences or the struggles that they've had as, as they've gone through the work that they're doing with us and with each other. And so, yeah, um, brains are great and also like super smart in some ways and super dumb in other ways. And so stereotypes is the super dumb part of your brain. It's the dumb, dumb part, uh, that part. Yes, get rid of that part. <laughs> in case I've never talked to any of you about what, how I call the regions of the brain, there's the dumb, dumb part of the brain that just tries to figure out whether you're gonna be killed or not by the person next to you. And then the smart, dumb smart part of the brain that works a little slower and is like, mm. <laughs> and then the smart, smart brain that is super duper slow and handles language and interactions and communication and stuff. And it is the last one to get there with us all the time. So the first thing that your brain does is it's like, Sheila, are you with me or against me? And then later it's like, Sheila's not gonna hurt you. Everything's fine. I keep pointing out people in the audience. There are like 10 of you and I know many names. <laughs> we might so. get to all of you at some point. <laughs> Just making examples. <laughs> Well, great, and, and that's another part of what makes um, all the different cultures and backgrounds of, that contribute to WordPress great is that everybody has different experiences that don't fit into these stereotypes. So it's important to ignore those dumb, dumb brain. <laughs> ignore your dumb, dumb brain, but not really, because it actually does keep you alive. Yes, so. yes, stay alive, but ignore it. <laughs> so you also talk about um, something called the negotiation of meaning, and um, basically, it's, would you mind defining that in your words? Not at all. How many of you are familiar with the concept of the negotiation of meaning? Wonderful, Perfect. I love this. Okay, so the negotiation of meaning um, is a basic part of communication practices where once you have gathered all the information together, the two people or multiple people who are participating in the conversation um, make sure that they understand each other. So uh, for instance, 
if, if I have arrived here and I say to you, Jonathan, we're going to have a fireside chat today, and your concept of fireside chat is like we're going to go have individual conversations with everybody at the table, but my concept is this. We have to do that part where it's like, okay, so what is my role? What is your role? What is the objective? And just making sure that everybody has the same pieces of information and the same pieces of language to, con to communicate about um, the process or the project that you're taking on. So that's... Mm -hmm a very broad concept of the negotiation of meaning. And how does jargon complicate that? <gasps> Things that we're comfortable saying that not everybody understands? Yeah. If any of you have ever seen any of my talks about the project or community or people or working with people, so literally anything I ever talk about, you've heard me talk about jargon and how it's a bad thing. Um, in the WordPress project as a whole, we really try to stay away from jargon where we can because, for one, since we're a global project, it makes it really hard to translate stuff, which you wouldn't think would be real, but it is. Um, but even, even simple regular phrases are difficult. Even simple to. regular phrases. So um, our designers at the company that I work for, I work for Automatic, um, refer to like minor changes and and icons and stuff as sprinkles, okay. and Every time they say that to me, I'm like, I hear you speaking English. I'm also speaking English, but you're on a different planet. And so, like, jargon doesn't even just adhere to, like, we're talking about uh, uh, servers and cloud hosting. Like, it's not even just that. It can be as basic as your current definition based on what we're talking about is not my current definition. Sprinkles for me are always on cupcakes. Sprinkles for our designers are, are minor changes that make a delightful experience for users. You know, well, Rainbow or chocolate sprinkles? <laughs> rainbow all the time. Jimmies. We call them jimmies in New England. Jimmies. Yeah. I've learned so much about New England in the last <laughs> come on, everybody come visit few minutes now. <laughs> um, so, when you're working with different cultures and different languages, um, that's magnified. Um, how talk about you were talking with me yesterday about uh, colors and how colors can, are, are even simple colors like we might think white is white, but another culture white might be something different. Yeah. So talk about that. That was really interesting. So more show of hands. Is anyone familiar with the um, what is it? Global Color Survey, World Color Survey. Okay. A couple. A couple people. So in the 1970s, there was this survey, which it, the, the methodology was heavily flawed. So uh, it, it has been re researched um, in, in current times. Uh, but in the 1970s, there was this research that was done about um, colors and how c different cultures name them and how they arrive at the names. Um, and in general, there are apparently 11 to 12 different motifs where people derive the names for colors that they um, have. And there was a theory, and it's harder to track, that all colors um, in, are introduced in languages in roughly the same order. And that some colors are not universal concepts, like green, blue is not a universal concept. And, and um, as we were talking about yesterday, like white, depending on your concept of what creates a color, is either a subtractive or a, an additive process. And so even something as basic as colors, where we feel like, you know, for the most part we understand it, but that whole thing with color blindness, like I, I love talking to people with um, with differing abilities from mine about their experiences because, like, I have the luxury of the full depth of my entire knowledge of being a human who exists as I exist. And so, like, when I talk to people who are colorblind, I'm always like, I don't, I do not understand how, I, like, I can't even comprehend how that looks. And and so having those interesting conversations with things that seem super real and universal and integrated in our lives um, is always interesting. And I think that that's a, a specific uh, and really interesting example of that. Yeah, so the example I gave was, well, white is the presence of all colors. But she said, well, if you're a painter, white is the absence of all other colors. Um, and I had never thought of that. So. It's because he's in technology, and so you add yes. all the colors together, and boom, you have white. But if you add all the colors together as an artist, you have murky colors, uh, yeah. browns and blacks, and yeah, yeah. Yeah, not, not nice colors. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely colors. <laughs> um, so another thing that you detail is, and we'll trademark, this is trademarked, but the Josephus five, five and five for the, for five and five for fostering collaborative culture. 
Yeah. Yeah. So I didn't actually trademark the phrase five and five, <laughs> but I have been using it for 10 years in my presentations. It's practically <laughs> yours. <laughs> um, so let's, let's go through each one real quick and we'll kind of talk about um, what your, your points are on each. So the first one is team tension. Oh man, this is my favorite thing. So I like to, when giving advice to people, I like to offer my like subversive advice that people are going to pretend isn't real. Um, so when we talk about integrating teams or working across cultures, no matter what your culture is defined as, like if you're talking about Americas versus Europe or versus Asia, that's a type of, of culture. But also the example that I use in that blog post is our designers versus our developers. Um, when people are talking about how to, how to integrate teams and make cultures work better together, there's sometimes this idea that that means that everyone has to get along perfectly and everything should be fine and everyone needs to agree. Um, and I don't think that's true. I think that uh, if everyone agreed on everything all of the time, then diversity wouldn't be an important thing that we have to work on. Um, and when we find people who are visually diverse from us but have the exact same life experiences, I think that we run into the same problems as we would have run into if we had all of the same looking people, you know? And so my subversive piece of advice is that any time that you want a, a diverse group and interesting um, perspective, perspectives on things, you have to be prepared to have some tension. And I don't think that that's a bad thing. Um, I just was in, so I'm a singer, and I was just in um, a rehearsal on Monday where our conductor was like, I don't want to say tension because tension's a bad word. Um, and the thing that I say in that blog post is uh, it doesn't matter, like tension is needed if you're going to have diversity. It's just that you have to find a way to take that and make it into jazz as opposed to discordant noise. That resonates for WordPressers because we super love jazz. If I ever find something where I can like make a quotable nugget about barbecue, y'all will be the first to know. <laughs> but until then, you have me with jazz. Hopefully, it comes with samples. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, music is is actually a very common background for developers yes. and designers. I find. There's, there's in structure WordPress, to we it. have a lot of musicians in WordPress. Yeah, we do. Yeah. There's, there's, I think it's similar. There's a lot of structure to both and. There's uh, different methodologies, and it kind of translates well. I'm going to tell you another subversive thing. Y'all get two today. Most of the time, people just get one. <laughs> I think that development is a creative process. Languages, so science and math and music, I think is all in the same basic part of the brain. It's in the language and processing part of the brain, because all of these things are semantic. Like It's all trying to say something, but putting something together in a, in a particular language so that it communicates the end product, whatever that end product and might be. Infinite possibilities with yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. So when I hear that people are like, oh, I'm a musician. I can't be in technology. Like, I don't agree with them at all. Matt Mullenweg, the founder of, the co-founder of WordPress, is a musician. I'm a musician. Sucks, We're just Matt. wandering around <laughs> doing these things. I think it's totally normal to have a music background here. Yes. Um, OK, the next one was respect and accountability. Oh, so this this is for this was from the team lead section. Um, you have to treat others with respect, but but hold yourself personally accountable. Um, I think it totally makes sense to say treat others with respect, but that other part for leaders sometimes is really hard. Um, I don't believe in the concept of being vulnerable for vulnerability's sake, but I do believe that all of our leaders should be vulnerable, especially when it comes to, hey, Micah. I said this thing that I assumed about you and I was wrong. I'm really sorry about that. I'll do better in the future. Like, that's it. <laughs> like, if you identify that you're, because we're human beings and we can't be perfect, but I think that the only way that leaders can, can move through that and create a sense of belonging and safety with the people that they're working with is to say, I offended you and I didn't realize it and I'm sorry, I'll do better. And I don't think there's anything wrong with holding yourself personally accountable for those things, so. I didn't offend Micah. He's, I don't think. <laughs> no, he's just, okay. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't get up and leave, so that's good. Not today. <laughs> <laughs> um, the next one was having a North Star. What do you mean by that? Yeah, I talk about this a lot. So um, for, for many of you who did not know that I currently am the executive director of things, you probably did not read my leadership post because it totally didn't matter to you. It was just like random news, and you're like, okay, great. Um, 
But I talk about it there, and I talked about it in the last um, thing that I did in London. Uh, so it comes up for me a lot, and I think it's important. Um, I really feel like if we don't know where we share our common understandings, understandings of things, for instance, in the middle of negotiation of meaning, and you don't say, and that's our end goal and here's why, what you end up doing is just like micromanaging people all the way to some unknown destination and you get tired and fatigued and they get tired and fatigued and like small iterative cycles like that make sense in some spaces, but I think and anyone who's worked with me closely knows that I'm always like, that is our end goal. This is the general story arc of how we're gonna get there. As long as you're kind of going that way. Like I mostly don't care how you get there except for like there's this thing that's super wrong. Don't do that. Everything else, like figure it out <laughs> that way. And I think that's really important. Otherwise people don't know how to row together and where they're rowing to. I'm just gonna use a lot of metaphors in here. Rowing. Perfect. <laughs> um, we kind of talked about this a little bit, but jargon-free is the way to be. <laughs> what, yes. Do you have anything to add to that? Uh, n n no. Okay. Uh, yes, I do. Uh, yeah. <laughs> just, it's just, there are, there are things that when you speak specifically in jargon, you're trying to accomplish. One of the things that um, you try to accomplish is to prove how much smarter you are than other people. And I, when I was a teenager, definitely wanted to be the smartest person in the room all the time and Thankfully, I stopped that because, like, it's great to be the smartest person in the room, I guess, but, like, if you're the smartest know-it-all person and no one understands you and no one wants to work with you, then it doesn't matter what you can do because no one will do it with you, and you know? No one to learn from. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and it's more of that meeting people where they are. Like, there's no point in trying to prove that you're smarter than everybody, and there's also no point in trying to distance yourself and make it clear that there's an us versus them. Like, um, it's really easy to get into, into camps because all people want to know that they fit somewhere, right? And we want to know that we belong. Yeah, and so the us versus them a little bit turns into like, this is my us, and I don't care who the them is. Like, this is my us. And just making it super clear that you don't want other people to belong with you doesn't make any sense to me. And so that's why I always fight for no jargon in the WordPress space. And I know that people really want it. And you know, some things we have to. And so we're, we're working on a glossary for the WordPress.org site so that everyone will know what we're talking about all the time. And I'm so excited. I love it. Yeah. Um, and then the last one, proximity aids familiarity. Yes. How many of you are familiar with the meme of the get-along shirt? Great, another <laughs> thing I get to teach you today. So there's this meme out there where these two children are, they're, they're put in a, one giant shirt because they've been fighting and so their parents' method for getting them to stop fighting is to put them in one big shirt and they have to cooperate on everything for the whole day. And it says get along on it. <laughs> um, so I... <laughs> That's, that's terrible, don't recommend that to any, I don't recommend that to parents probably. Um, you can find a nicer way to do it. Um, but I have found over the course of my career leading people and, and helping to mentor leaders that when you have people who are saying, I don't like working with this person, I don't like working with designers, I don't like working with developers, um, we don't get better at that by just like, wishing for it to change. Like we all are people and we have to practice those things. And so I have found the best way to get people to like figure out that they actually don't hate each other is be like, hey, I know you don't quite get along, but there's this really important project and you unite them around the, the process and around the project um, and convince them to kind of put their egos aside for a second and do something that um, that is productive toward the same space. And I with some notable exceptions, found that that was really helpful for them, for me too. <laughs> the notable exceptions were definitely not in WordPress. It's all fine. Okay, those are all the notes I had from reading your blog post. Fantastic. What, what else would you like to add? Well, um, so. We want to get to everybody's questions. Yeah. I think we're right on somewhere. I, I think, think we, we could open it up for some questions. Um, I, I know we're not live streaming, but 
if you all want to share with Twitter that people can share their questions and I have a colleague down here to help us get them uh, from Twitter in case they show up. You can, of course, tweet uh, with the hashtag WCATL, but also the hashtag Sassy Pickle, so that we can find you, slash I can find you later to answer the questions on Twitter, except I was told le yesterday that I didn't answer one from Miami, and I have to go back and answer that. Totally going to do it. You might have to find her in six months and tell her to answer your uh, yeah, question. Yeah, yeah. Miami was like three months ago. Oh, OK. Sassy Pickle. Not yeah. that bad. Yes. <laughs> Let's take some questions about about Leader, not leadership. What are we talking about? Fostering, fostering, co fostering uh, collaboration. Collaborative, collaborative and then I'll tell you about why I'm a sassy pickle. So, is any questions? Yes. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about the five and five? You you talk about the team tension. I found this fascinating because so as I work with global teams, I would think the British people had all the answers. The Asian people were kind of quiet. Like we would have these phone calls at all hours and. And this was really fascinating when you just said that because I had in my mind like what my role was in it, you know, what different countries and I had never considered like we could have collaborated better and yeah. created something that we like knew that wasn't even thought of. Yeah. You just that was really fascinating, but I'm not sure I got what five and five. Was. Oh, okay. I'll explain both those things. Okay. First off, five and five refers to uh, uh, just a structure of my presentations that I give, where I give five pieces of advice on one side of a coin and five pieces of advice on another side of the coin. And so the sides of the coin in this case were people who are leading from the front versus people who are leading from within. Um, and so that's all that that was about. So <laughs> it's not like a product. It's just a thing I say. Um, so the, quest the other question was about um, that first piece of advice that I gave to leaders where you have to expect some tension in teams where you're, where you're uh, fostering collaboration. Um, I wanted to call to everyone's attention this fantastic resource called the Cultural Atlas. Um, and the URL is culturalatlas.sbs.com.au. Uh, it was pulled together by um, SBS, which is an Australian, basically, public broadcasting system like we have here. Um, and it specifically is geared toward their primary migrant cultures. And they did a lot of excellent research. And it's um, a, a kind of a living resource for them. But um, yeah, so especially when you're working in, in a global space and you have all of these cultures, um, the difficulty is that we hardly know where those cross cultures, um, cross cultural connections are happening. Because at, at this point, with WordPress for sure, but probably with your group also, like every collection of, my, of majorities that you have um, is made up in any number of minority groups, right? And so finding a way to um, respectfully get people to, to give you the information that you need is really important. Finding out, like, if, if I'm working with a primarily Dutch company, what is the best way for me to manage the overall negotiation process and their m methods of communication and, and like, how, f how funny you're allowed to be or whatever it is, um, and, and doing your best to meet people where they are. It doesn't work. Uh, as far as like expect some tension to just be like everyone get in there and hope hope it all works out like you've got to do some of the advance work as a leader to say hey it sounds like we have some miscommunication here when you said this thing is this what you meant over there and then you have to facilitate that negotiation of meaning section sometimes um, it would be wonderful if the negotiation of meaning meeting mm, meaning happened at the beginning of things and lasted forever. But it's kind of a cycle. <laughs> you negotiate the meaning, and then you discover that there's this new cross-cultural space, and then you have to negotiate some more meaning in there, just kind of over and over as a cycle. Does that answer the question a bit? Yeah, I think so. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Hi. Um, we, have, uh, we had a mic coming around. I think we lost it. I am the mic. We'll, we'll just try to repeat the question it. for the um, for the people on the, yeah. the video. And I'll repeat it for the video. We're getting a thumbs up. First of all, let me say that as a, a business trainer myself, this presentation was excellent on Yay. leadership. And we did it. Excellent <laughs> to the points that were shared. So Thank I you. highly commend you for the expertise that you shared today and the manner in which you did it. Oh, thanks. <laughs> You're very welcome. Um, one of the things that I do 
when I'm starting a new group and I'm developing mentors to work with newbies. I make the mentors do an exercise in listening skill. Yes. And so they sit with the chairs back to back, so they're facing mm -hmm. opposite directions. And I give them interesting characters I find online. And one year I used Arabic letters. Okay. Because Americans don't know Arabic letters. And one person has to describe it, the other person has to draw it. Oh, wow. Okay. And then the exercise is reversed, so they get both sides, and then there's a general conversation about how difficult that was, and how what they said was not translated into the drawing. Mm -hmm. And so I think that the conversation about starting it early is really part of my commitment to doing that right from the get-go, yeah. you know, that when the team comes together, exercises like that could be a great way for saying, We've got to find the common ground. We've got yes. to use language that we all will agree to. So I just think that what you've shared today is really priceless information. Oh, thank you so much. You're doing great. I'll put it in recording. This was a lovely compliment. It's all up there. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I'm not very good at Pictionary, for the record. <laughs> Jonathan Drawing the, uh, Getting people to guess it. <laughs> so, so this was this was kind of a, um, a kind of talking about team team connections and team building exercises a little bit. Yeah, um, an interesting thing that I noticed recently about team building. Um, I think, by the way, that as a, as a collective group of human beings, we are about to move into a newer, um, more modern concept of leadership that is not about like scare everyone and hope they do what you need them to do. Like um, that's we're past that now, and I'm glad of it because um, I remember in my first number of team building experiences I ever had, it basically was like put them in a dire situation so they feel bonded by the fear. Like why would you do that? They're like put them in a giant tree and make them. Zip line down, and yeah, like that was how we did team building. Um, and hearing about this exercise, this was a listening exercise for anyone who did not hear, where um, you give um, a, to a, a pair. One of them describes, um, in this case, an Arabic alphabet um, uh, character, and the other one has to draw it, and then they switch uh, so that everyone kind of has that shared experience of we don't all communicate the same way, and we don't all visualize things the same way. Um, and yeah, absolutely, I love hearing new team building exercises that are based on like uncovering our basic understandings as human beings, as opposed to our basic understandings as things that want to not die in our dumb dumb brains. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. See, it was really useful. I told everyone about my dumb dumb brain, smart smart brain. You knew it would come in handy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, say you're trying to get to know somebody from another culture. Mm -hmm. What would be your talk like? That is a fantastic question. The question is, if you're getting to know someone from a new culture, what are like the top three things you can ask uh, to make sure that you get to know them better? In, a, in an office setting, in a working together setting, I think that the things that are important in my mind to know are, um, <laughs> one, like how literal are you going to take things? <laughs> how, how much can I use humor to soften the blow? Um, how direct do I have to be or can I be? Um, the other thing that I think is always important to know is whether, whether, hmm, what are the right words? Whether they primarily want the relationship to be transactional or if they do want to have the opportunity to get to know you as a person. There are varying scales of that. Like workspaces are by nature transactional, but if you're working in distributed spaces like I do, um, and like most WordPress volunteers do, at least when they're volunteering, you have to know, like, do you want me to have small talk before I have conversations with you? Um, and then generally asking people how they, um, how they best take direction for themselves. Like, they will know whether it's best if you write it down ahead of time and give it to them and then they can ask questions, or if you can just show up to the meeting and be like, hey, I've got this new task, here are all the things, so they can ask questions then. Um, so just asking them how they need the information. There is this uh, thing that I use um, with my teams. It's called, I call it, um, personal operating manual. 
And so everyone on my team, and I don't, I don't have these anymore because I don't have lots of direct reports um, like this now. But when I had, uh, when I was managing teams, every person had their own notebook where I wrote down like what motivated them and how they preferred to get information and how they preferred to participate in meetings and if they needed things ahead of time so that they had time to like think through it and research it. And so like I knew for each of my team, my team members, what it was that that made them want to continue to come to work and how I could meet them um, where they were as far as how they needed to be communicated with and how they needed to take feedback and how I could best set them up for personal success with the work that I was asking them to do. So personal operating manual, that is a thing that is, is Googleable. Everyone knows about it, but um, I loved it. So. And some of those things are things you might have to find out through working with someone. You might not oh, be yes. able to directly say, how direct do you want me to be? You know? <laughs> right. But uh, you might have to experiment a little bit and what's the best way for you to figure that out from yeah. people. Yeah, for sure. Good point. Yeah. To anchor his question about if you're meeting somebody and going to work with somebody from another culture, I find go to the embassy or the consulate from that country. <coughs> yes. Yeah. So um, I'm a history major by academic training, and I believe in doing your homework and preparing my research. Same. So. This this was a, a follow-on comment to a couple of the last questions we had, which was saying, um, go to the resources that exist, the consulate for the country, um, if you're going to be doing a lot of, of work in that space. And yeah. There's also here in the metro Atlanta area, there are several dozen foreign uh, chambers of Commerce. Oh, Foreign Chambers of Commerce. Yes, excellent. And, um, for example, I've, um, I'm working to support an event that's taking place uh, from the Association of Chinese Professionals. Okay. And I'm, I'm president of a uh, inventors association. Okay. And they're looking for people who want to do business in China. And, you know, so they're going to have to get prepared if they are an American person yeah. and now they're going to be interviewed by a panel of Chinese professionals yeah. to see whether or not they qualify to go on to the final rows of competition in China. Yeah. Somebody somewhere needs to be able to say, hello, yeah. we have stuff. some prep work to do here. Yeah. <laughs> Another question back here, it sounds like. Who are we? Bridget? Oh. Or back in the back? Oh. You say Colby? K-O-L-B-E assessment. Yep, and then a print assessment is like your intrinsic motivator. So it's really interesting because everyone on my team like has those. Yeah. Up front, like, well, I'm just curious, you know, like, it's those questions that maybe you don't know how to self-diagnose yourself or, like, part of the, it's part of our hiring process. Yeah. Like, what role it might fit well in. So if we're going to be doing that, it's really interesting to see how it's going to be. Yeah. They want to invest in, like, really making sure everyone's in the right role and operating. Yeah. Is that print assessment? A, what was the second one? A print assessment? Print assessment. We have about 15 minutes left. That was, those, that was a note that um, you can add additional um, testing into your hiring process with the Colby something and the print personal assessment. Personal operating manual. Yeah, to the personal operating manual. Um, I think we have time for one more question, and I think it's Birgit. All right. Um, so oh. talking about cultures, there's also a different way how Coaches react to decisions or what looks like a decision. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I had this in my own uh, work when I was working with an American, um, or when I started out of working with American, American clients. And uh, so we were talking about all the different kind of options. And then um, there was this comment from the client okay, well, let's do it this way. And this was for me as a German a decision yes. that is written with a capital B. Yeah, yeah. So, and that's where we move forward. So, um, but that was not understood at the American end. It was just kind of a one of the options and let's try and play around with it for a bit. But I kind of built the whole thing. And then of course, um, 
and then what happened was that the decision was reversed. Yeah. So kind of okay. So and then I read up about it that yeah. that's um, kind of the Germans write decisions with a capital D and Americans write it with a small d. Yeah. And there's also a lot of cultures out there. Uh, not all, yeah, a lot of cultures that kind of thing. But how how do you navigate that kind of thing? So I wish I had a clear answer. The question is, how do you navigate? How do you navigate um, situations where the expectation around what you have done are different? So in this example, it was a decision forever versus like, I think this is the decision. I think we should explore this as our option, like how, how concrete something is. I wish I had an answer for like how you manage it because that would be excellent. But um, I've not actually explored how I got to the point where I am with that. So I've been working with global teams for, gosh, almost a decade now. Uh, I don't feel old. You feel old. Um, and, and I know that when I started doing that, I ran into problems like that all the time, where I would say something confidently, because like confidence is a thing we value in America. Um, and the confidence came across as, oh, well, I guess we're doing that from this person who's definitely not in a decision-making capacity, you know? And the people would do things because I'd been so confident, and then I was like, ah, no, I can't make final choices, don't do that. Um, I have learned <laughs> over time how to manage that better, but I don't know if it's so much like, this is how I learned how to do it, um, as, as much as it was at some point, I learned that um, the voice that I have is not inconsequential, um, and it hasn't been inconsequential for a long time. Um, and so learning to be more careful with the way that I um, manage discussions and the way that I contextualize, like this is something that I'm interested in discussing, I don't have the, all the answers yet, help me figure out where I could be wrong about it. Like learning to be aware of the fact that that with a big voice comes, to sound trite, big responsibilities, you know? Like, um, we have a number of people in the WordPress community across our entire ecosystem who are, who people look to as like trendsetters, and sometimes when they are not aware of that, like they can make offhanded remarks about something that's happening or not happening and change the course of an entire career on accident. Um, and so I, I learned that in a really um, not as, as high stakes space as, as the work that I do now. Um, and I'm glad that I did because I think that a lot of people don't have the luxury of like, the only error that I made was to make someone make a set of charts that took them 10 hours and now I feel like a jerk. Like that, that was the biggest extent of, of my errors that helped me learn that. But like if I think about had I tried to do that learning from this stage, you know, from this stage in my career, like how awful um, I could have, have made some people's lives, it's, it's humbling and also uh, sometimes terrifying. Um, but I don't have a quick answer other than like, go make some non-consequential mistakes, which is not useful advice. So. We, we kind of see that a lot in WordPress core too, um, or I do when a ticket might get open and then I might brain dump into the ticket, but someone will take it as direction and then three hours later, there's a patch yeah. and it's a big patch and they're like, well, wait, we still have to think about things before we write code. And, um, so it's even a problem with that. It's very hard to communicate emotion and text and intent. Yeah, and you'll notice that in, in any post that I put up where it's not a final decision, like I put it in the title, I'm like, discussion, mm -hmm. the first thing. So that's what comes up in people's RSS feeds. It comes up in their emails. It comes up as they're reading it, unless they don't read the title, which that's true for some people, and I can't make them. But <laughs> some people don't read the post, but they still comment. Uh, yeah, also that, also that. But yeah, <laughs> contextualizing what you expect out of the conversation um, it feels cumbersome when you start doing it. It feels uncomfortable, but I think it's really valuable um, to avoid, you know, exactly things like that. People yeah. who are like, well, Jonathan said it, so now we must. Do we have time for a quick? This is a practical thing. This is 52 after we really need to give everybody time to get Okay. 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 So here's we'll what we'll, we'll do. We'll wrap up and we'll, Jonathan and I will be out there and you all can come and ask us additional questions. Thank you so much for having me today, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.